It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. Today's guest is Jason Kruger, president and founder of Signature Analytics. Jason is shaking up the way business owners run their businesses by highlighting the gaps in data and reporting that many business owners face and sharing insights on how to improve profitability, increase productivity, and run their company smarter. Jason has over 20 years of experience in the accounting and business advisory field, working with middle market companies and nonprofits. Jason Kruger, welcome into the corner office. Thanks, Brent. Yeah, great to have you here. We, we found you in beautiful San Diego today, I believe. Uh, my One of my favorite spots, a place I still call home. I haven't lived there for over 40 years, although I try to get back often. And when people ask me where I'm from anywhere in the world, I always say California, San Diego. If they know that, I say my beautiful La Jolla. How long have you lived there? Most of my life, actually. I have okay. uh, actually have Midwestern roots. Uh, yeah. Both of my parents grew up on farms in the state of Iowa. Uh, but uh, we, and I was born there, but moved out to the San Diego area when I was uh, pretty young. And so I went to, uh, growing up in San Diego, went to high school in San Diego, um, went to college in Arizona and then came back because it's hard to leave, you know, San Diego. It's hard to beat it. So I came back and, and said, I got family here still and have the opportunity to start a career here. And it's been great. Awesome. Well, let's talk about those early years. We also share that in common. One side of my family comes from an Iowa farm. My mother, uh, who's descended from Dutch um, folks yep. who, who did a lot of farming in that part of the world. Maybe that's part of your heritage, too. Yep, um, that's German. Uh, yep. met, met a Navy guy uh, out in Long Beach, California. My dad, who actually is eighth generation Californian. So I'm ninth. You know, I have too many of us around, but wow. it ends with me. My, my kids were born outside, but uh, you know, he grew up in La Jolla, a beautiful part of the world. But let's talk about your early years. So what, what part of Iowa did you grow up in? And, you know, what was that early family life like? Yeah, so I was born in West Des Moines. Uh, my parents, uh, they, they moved there after you know, my, my dad graduated college and got a job. Uh, prior to that, all of our relatives are in uh, kind of near Cedar Falls, uh, Waterloo area, about uh, 30, 45 minutes away. In uh, those small, one of the couple of the small towns in Iowa, you know, 1,500 people. Uh, everybody knows everybody. Uh, summer, it's all about the community pool, all that fun stuff. Um, <laughs> great, but, great uh, Midwestern, great Midwestern yeah. stock. Bre brothers and sisters, how big was your family? Yeah, so I have a brother and a sister. I'm the oldest, um, and so it's myself, my brother, and my sister in that order. Awesome. Awesome. We're all about four years apart. Uh, did move to San Diego when I was very young, but all of our family vacations were to go back and see family back in Iowa. So while my friends were going to Hawaii for their family vacation, <laughs> I was going back to Iowa. But Cedar Rapids. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want anything else. It was great. Uh, it's <laughs> amazing. My, my mom's brother still farms. Um, so I even bring we even bring our kids back there now, and they love it. Mother, uh, mom focused on raising the kids, or did she work outside the home? Yeah, my mom actually, yeah, she raised, uh, raised us kids. Uh, that's a what I realize now is a full-time job in and of itself. Um, <laughs> Plus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My dad uh, spent, uh, started, actually started his career in accounting as well. Um, I kind of followed my dad's footsteps in that area. Uh, he also uh, was involved in starting a couple businesses and involved. Uh, so I think I got that itch from him. Um, I said, uh, hey, it looks like, you know, you've done well. 
Uh, I was always told that accounting is the, the foundation of business if, if from the bottom up. Um, and if you understand the numbers, you'll understand the business. And so I went that route, um, not to be a career accountant, but to really, you know, strengthen my my foundation and um, and then leverage that to basically where I've where I've gotten to be today. Good, good inspirational early, early stuff from dad. What about mom? What kind of things do you remember uh, mom taught you when you were growing up? I feel like I was very fortunate. She uh, was the, the the parent or the mom that everybody loved and loves. Um, they're both still living in San Diego. Nice. Uh, nice. Very social, involved in everything, very involved in her kids, our lives, uh, very in, involved in other aspects of the community. Um, so very fortunate to have two parents that are, have been married over 50 years and uh, still see them and, and uh, still have a great relationship with them. A rarity these days. Good stuff. Tell us about some of the other folks that were some of your influencers, Jason, as you were growing up. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I think my, my dad was a big influence in my life um, as far as you know, growing up and, and, and being a boy and, um, and as far as career. Um, you know, my dad grew up on a farm. He, uh, he always says, and then, then he got a degree and, and he started in the business world and he said, hey, I, I didn't know anything. He's like, I, I came off the farm. I, I didn't even know how to, know how to dress to my first you know business dinner and had no idea what to do and so the best advice he ever gave me from that perspective is when you go to a business dinner don't be the first one to grab the food don't be the first one to do anything just observe and see how everybody what everybody else is doing mm. and follow their path because you don't want to be the uh you don't want to be the fool who's jumping into the bread jumping into some other areas when when nobody else is and so he said just just sit back and observe and make sure that you're following the crowd in those situations and, and uh, don't want to stand out in a negative way. Good counsel. Were you a good student in secondary, primary school, high school? I was a pretty good student. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I was good, but not great. Um, I, I, you know, I had uh, mostly B's with mi mix, mixed in some A's in there as well, um, probably in high school and college. I think my GPA was about the same in high school and college. Um, and uh, so I would say I was I was not a straight A student, but I was uh, I was a pretty good student. What were some of your other uh, activities and interests? Any sports, music, theater, debate? Yeah, I love I love sports. I really enjoy uh, I and because it's in my blood. I grew up a huge Iowa Hawkeye fan. Uh, football, basketball, their women's basketball team now is is pretty good actually as well. It's been pretty pretty fun to watch them. Uh, because I was in San Diego, I grew up a San Diego Padre fan, uh, played all sports growing up, um, still, uh, you know, really enjoy that. Actually, I, I once a year, I go back with my dad to a an Iowa Hawkeye uh, football game. So we're, we're doing that again this year. And the plan is to do that. So um, try to pick a good game on the schedule, go back, stay at some, stay at one of my uncle's places and, and enjoy a game. Uh, I was also involved, nice. very involved with uh, theater uh, through our through my church growing up, um, we did a pretty pretty uh, in depth pretty pretty big uh, musical every year. That I think I was one of the few boys, so I was, always ended up with one of the bigger parts because of it. Um, but I enjoyed that um, and just being social and being with friends. What about entrepreneurial things uh, when you were younger? You know, did you have the ubiquitous paper route? Did you get involved yeah. in selling Christmas cards at you know Christmas time? Tell yeah. us about some of that stuff. It's actually funny. So, in, I went to college, University of Arizona, and I had a a roommate, and we were both, you know, we we knew nothing, and we were both going to conquer the world, and you know, retire when we were twenty five at that point, right? Is, it, is it what everybody thinks? And so uh, we came up with this idea to, and the University of Arizona is in the city of Tucson. So we came up with this idea to create what we called the Tucson Money Saver. And so we walked around different businesses around campus, um, pizza shops, other, you know, B2, uh, B2C businesses, I guess, and, um, and told them we were business uh, majors at the University of Arizona, uh, part of, and we kind of stretched the truth a little bit, said we were, you know, part of what we were doing is uh, creating this Tucson money saver. And basically what it was is we were 
putting together a newspaper that basically was just simply um, coupons from those establishments. And uh, if they wanted the front page of that of that uh, money saver, they could. Uh, it was probably a couple hundred bucks, and every uh, placement in the in the paper was um, was you know an x x a certain number of uh, certain number of dollars. Uh, we we had grant visions of grandeur as it relates to distribution. So we actually uh, and we did it. We we printed ten thousand copies. Um, and we distributed them all over the the school, all around the the city of Tucson, wherever we could. We probably put them, you know, we put them in places where we probably shouldn't have put them. We probably put them in uh, newspaper stands that weren't for our for our Tucson money saver. Um, but we were, you know, eighteen year old college students, and um, we thought, you know, this was the first of of uh, a business that was going to take us to new heights, and. Um, we then quickly realized how much effort it was to actually get the papers printed and bound and and positioned and then distribute them. And uh, we made, I think we ended up making a few hundred bucks on it profit. And uh, the hourly rate we put into it was probably minimum wage. And <laughs> we decided that we probably are, our, our time and efforts are best fit, uh, you know, probably actually continuing our studies. And so we had one edition of the Tucson Money Saver. And uh, that was it. So that was my entrepreneurial <laughs> venture in college. Um, I've always actually my my approach is I, I haven't really I have an entrepreneurial spirit, but historically I want to make sure I have the foundation that will allow myself to be successful. So as you go into my career, I really built that foundation through my career and and where I started my career that allowed me to leverage my background. Uh, and give me credibility to start the business I have now. Um, and so, but at that time, you know, we were young, 18, we were going to go do it and we did it. And then we decided that we'd stay with one issue of the Tucson Money Saver and, and that would be it. Was it clear growing up, uh, Jason, that you'd go to college? Yeah, I think so. I think that was the general path um, and thought process. Um, again, looking back, um, you really don't know what you don't know, but it was definitely emphasized. I think my dad was the first uh, individual uh, in his family that went to college, um, or he has a few brothers. I think uh, two or th two or three of the brothers actually went to, to college. Before that, obviously, nobody had. They it was a farm. They were all farmers. One of the brothers continued with farming as a as an educator or as a occupation and the other three went into went to college to some degree uh, my mom went to a, a vocational school i think a two-year uh, vocational school but i think uh, growing up it was always you know part of the process was that you would go to uh you would you'd go to you know early education and then you'd go to college Dad obviously had an input on your major. Any, any regrets about getting that uh, degree in accounting or has that served you well over the years? No, I don't think so. I think it's definitely served me well. I think that, again, it's a trade. It's, it's accounting is a trade that takes time and, and a lot of years to perfect and learn. There's so much nuances in accounting, something that you can always fall back on. My goal was to get into accounting because I wanted to get into business. Um, that was the way I knew and had observed uh, a, as a path to get into business. Um, I think, you know, they're knowing now what I didn't know then, you know, there's other paths, obviously, as well. Finance, uh, marketing, sales, um, you know, a lot of what well, you'll see uh, CEOs um, come actually from the sales side, um, which, which I've observed. Um, but, you know, CEOs can come from all different sure. aspects sure. of business and life. Uh, so it's, it's been a, it's been a very, um, I didn't go into, I don't, I wouldn't say I love accounting. That's not my passion. My passion is business. Uh, my passion is the starting the company that I have now and leveraging my background to support other businesses to, to grow and to achieve the goals that they have for, for their, themselves and their business. What was that first job you took out of college? And, and why did you choose that over other opportunities? 
Yeah, I went the public accounting route. So I started my career at Moss Adams, which is a large national uh, public accounting firm. I spent two years there, and then I went to Deloitte, which is one of the big four firms. So I spent almost 10 years in public accounting in the financial statement audit uh, side. And, and the idea behind that was actually when I left college, I said, hey, you know what, I'll go, I'll go public accounting. I'll go two years. Uh, it takes about two years to get your CPA. I got my CPA and I said, hey, you know, I'll go two years and then I'll get my CPA. And then again, it's I'll go take over the world. What I realized after two years of, of being in public accounting is I still didn't know anything. Uh, you know, I, I still didn't. There's still so much to learn. I mean, I knew that I learned, but I was still pretty green. I felt that I just continued to learn so much uh, every year when I'd reevaluate my career. Public accounting and those types of firms give you exposure that you, you can't get anywhere else. You get exposure with all types of companies. You get to see how they operate. You get exposure with all types of industries, public companies. I worked on Fortune 500 companies. I worked on small startups. I worked on venture-backed companies, private equity, uh, apparel, manufacturing, um, professional service, all, all across the board um, as far as types of companies that I worked with. And so that exposure to see how companies work and operate and to go on site to those companies and those locations and see physically see how they operate, I mean, that 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 exposure was invaluable. And I just continued. And I learned over my career that the longer I stayed in public accounting, when I did want to leave, uh, I could open up even more doors. It would give me that credibility and that foundation. Um, and so I stayed almost 10 years and I made senior manager. And then I got to a point where uh, my options were, you know, public accounting is you either move up or you move out. My next step would be a partner. And I never had a, a desire to be a partner. Uh, at a public accounting firm as a full-time career. I wanted to branch out and le leverage my background. And so at that point in 2008, I decided to leverage my background and start where I'm at now, which is Signature Analytics. Well, I want to talk about in a second, but I want to dive a little deeper into your um, public accounting experience. Did you have leadership responsibilities early on there with either of those companies? Well, right out of the gates, no. Uh, right out of college, you know, you're um, you're you're drinking out of a fire hose, trying to to understand, you know, what's going on. Again, accounting in and of itself is very technical. To I, I equate it to a trade. You have you're a tradesman, and you have to learn your trade. Uh, once you learn your trade, then you can you can begin to to take ownership and and start to manage and manage others at their trade. Um, I was very fortunate that I had very a couple of individuals that really took me under their arm in those early years and and helped me really understand and learn that trade and also helped me to you know on, quite honestly learn how to be a professional because it's not just learning your trade it's not doing good work it's learning how to be a professional learning how to properly communicate in the professional environment uh learning how to um you know achieve the results that you need to achieve in the time span that it takes to achieve those results uh, or that is required of that. Um, and so there was so much learning in those early years. Uh, after uh, about uh, two years, uh, then you you start in public accounting, you start to, to earn some level of uh, responsibility and management of other individuals. Um, in effect, you're managing, you're starting to manage other individuals that are right out of college. And so you're starting to take them under your wings. You're starting to manage them um, and their success on the engagements that you're part of. And then you're managing up to the, the uh, in our case, my case, the audit manager, and then ultimately the partner uh, on that engagement as well. Tell us about some of the challenges that you had uh, when you first started managing people. In a professional world, it was, uh, it was new to me. Um, I had various jobs. I, I actually officiated basketball growing up in, in high school and, and in college. And um, there's a lot, uh, there's a, it's a good experience to be able to do that, manage a game, manage the coaches, manage expectations, uh, manage the, the players and manage the team you're working with. So, so there's a lot of qualities that came from that and a lot of ex great exposure I got from just being out there on an island, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, but I think, um, you know, from a, what I've learned over time is, is 
most of success is based on communication and how you communicate and how you motivate others. You want to make sure that you provide the right oversight, but we also want to make sure that we give the individual the opportunity to perform and to fail, uh, but within the parameters that still allow the engagement to be successful. And so, you know, early on it was, again, it was sitting down with the individual, teaching them, helping them to understand, being there to answer questions. And I think, you know, as we move into a more a uh, hybrid world or a world that's remote, that is that creates some challenges for, I think, newer individuals and, and their ability to learn. Um, I always had the opportunity to learn sitting next to the person when I had a question I could ask them. Uh, same thing when I was working and managing another individual. Over time, uh, I then moved up and began to manage entire engagement. So it was reporting directly to the partner and there's administrative uh, work that goes along with that as well, managing the team, managing the timeline, managing the success of the engagement. So um, various levels of management, um, obviously, as I continue to grow in my career. So you left Deloitte in 2008, which is a very tumultuous time economically for the economy, not right. just in the U.S., but globally, right. and founder, founded Sig Signature Analytics. Now, two questions. Number one, did the economic downturn have you know any impact or motivation perhaps for founding the business um and if not tell us a little bit about kind of your thinking behind going out at that particularly at that period of time yeah. to found this uh, new venture i i honestly think i had my mindset and i didn't care what was going on in the world i was going to do it and i was going to make it happen um, i was in a period of my life where it made sense to me i was in my early 30s i was newly married. Um, I had a very understanding wife that had a very uh, strong career that could support this venture, I guess, financially. We didn't have kids, um, so I was able to really put in the time and effort to do that. I had uh, decided that I wanted to do that probably in early 2008 uh, or maybe late 2007. Um, took some time to really kind of formulate how I was going to approach this. Um, the funny thing is, though, that when I did actually give my notice that I was going to leave, probably three or four days later is when I, you know, turn on the news and Lehman Brothers collapses, and <laughs> I'm finding out, you know, I'm like, who's this Ben Bernanke? You know, I haven't, I haven't seen him before really on the, and he's talking about, you know, everything going on. I'm like, well, uh, the good thing is I don't have any revenue anyway right now, so I can't get, can't, you know. Nothing bad can really happen, and I don't ha I don't have any employees, so I don't have any commitments. So I'm starting at ground zero. So let's start and let's see what what can happen. You can only go up from there. What 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 was the motivation? What was the unmet need that you saw? And you know, yeah. with that answer, tell us a little bit about what Signature Analytics does. Working at Deloitte, I had the opportunity to work with all different types of companies, and I mentioned I worked with Fortune 500 companies, but my the, what I really enjoyed was working with that small mid market. And I was in San Diego uh, at that time. And San Diego is built on the small mid market. Um, there's only a hand, there's only two or three fortune 500 companies. It's built on, you know, that mid market. And um, that's the foundation of business in San Diego. So I had the opportunity to really see uh, all different types of industries, different types of businesses. And what I really observed, what I observed quite a bit was that a lot of companies um, that were even, that were working with Deloitte, they looked at, in the mid-market, they looked at accounting as a necessary evil, meaning I have to pay my bills, I have to invoice, I have to make sure I have enough cash for payroll, and I have to file my taxes at the end of the year. And what they weren't, and they weren't getting value out of the accounting and finance function of their business. And, and what I mean by that is they weren't getting visibility into their business through reporting. Uh, they didn't have visibility into the margins of their business. Maybe they knew their margins in their head as a whole, but maybe they're a business that has multiple product lines. They don't understand the, pro the margin by product line. It really impacts the ability to truly make good decisions to, to, impact, to impact and achieve the goals that they have as they move forward. 
The other, uh, they're also, you know, they're, these are companies that have outgrown their current team. Uh, they, they had a bookkeeper, they had a lower level individual, they may have promoted them to a controller, but they still really have a bookkeeper, uh, you know, skill set. And so they're starting to feel those challenges. They, they're, they're starting to work with banks or um, investors or, or third parties that want to see their financial information. And uh, the worst thing that a company can do when a third party wants to see financial information is just to, is to hit print on QuickBooks or whatever accounting system they use and send it over. Because that, tell, that doesn't tell the story that you want to be told to that third party. That gives a, a wide open book look to that third party to make to come to any conclusions or assumptions that they want to come to um, without you being able to tell the story that you want to really be able to tell. And so in addition, those companies, even if they wanted to hire the top talent, that top talent's very expensive and is going to bigger companies that can pay more. Um, and those companies also uh, in the mid-market, they don't necessarily need that full-time controller or full-time CFO, but they need that, that expertise. And so the idea that, that I brought is, uh, you know, I'm not, we're not, Signature Analytics does not perform the same services as Deloitte. We don't do audit work. We don't do tax work. Um, we work with our clients to make sure and provide a solution for their accounting and finance function of their business. We leverage their existing team in most cases. We assess their, their people, their processes, their technology, um, their reporting infrastructure. And then we work with them to build a roadmap to give them so that they can gain value and success from accounting and finance to achieve the goals they have as a business. And that starts with the basics, um, basic processes, making sure roles and responsibilities are in place at each level, um, the oversight's in place. But then it comes down to, can we close the books and can we get good reporting on a monthly basis uh, and, and provide that analysis and, and strategy to our client, which is usually the CEO management team, so that they can make, they have the visibility to really make decisions and move forward. And so it's been it's been huge for that mid market. Uh, it's a huge it's a fantastic solution, and we can be it's a very flexible and scalable cost point as well. Jason, what do you think makes an efficient accounting process for a middle market company, and how can a business owner tell if it's working? From the business owner's perspective, uh, there's there's a couple things. One, uh, the business owner can see if it's working because they they can sleep well at night. And they, they don't have any concerns about, are we going to make payroll? Uh, you know, do we have enough cash for, you know, what's our cash flow looking like? And am I getting good reporting? So from a, from a high level, it's, am I getting consistent reporting? That's, uh, we call it ARP, accurate, relevant, and timely. Am I getting accurate, relevant, and timely reporting and financial information on my business in the manner that I want to look at it on a consistent basis? What goes on behind the scenes then are the processes to get you there, um, which is to close the books on a consistent basis. The, uh, there's a good, you know, to make sure we have supporting schedules and confidence in what's happening so that we can really dig in uh, if we need to deeper into the business as to really what's going on. Um, and then the other piece is, is the team supported effectively, the lower level team? Is there, a right, is there the right oversight? When uh, payments are being made, is there a process on how we pay to, to, to maximize and, and manage cash flows effectively? Is there a process on how we invoice to make sure that we're getting paid effectively and, and timely and in a manner that can maximize cash flow? For businesses, what, what I've found is cash is king. Cash flow is critical to a business. Um, and, and managing cash flow and, and appropriately to ensure that the business can reinvest into their business or, um, or, or have, uh, or make the right decision or be able to make decisions based on cash flow is critical. What, what are some of the metrics that you help business owners with to determine if their business is really profitable? Yeah, I, there's, for me, it depends on your, your industry, obviously. Um, there's a couple of areas. One is, uh, what's your gross margin? So you have, let's say you're a manufacturing company, you have, uh, you sell products. So you sell your products for X, how much, and that costs you Y. And what's the, you know, the difference is your, is your margin. And then you look at what that percentage is. 
So understanding the margin in your industry is critical. And then talking about how we can beat that margin. What are some areas that we can we can gain an extra couple percentage points? Um, I, when I hear a business owner, when I ask a business owner what their margin is, and they say, well, it's about you know 50%, there's a lot of opportunity for improvement. Because about 50% could mean it's 48%. It could mean it's 52%. 4% swing is huge. That 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 4% um, difference is the difference in your bottom line. Uh, because below that is your, what we call your SG&A, so your sales and general administrative, more of your fixed costs below that. But if you can manage your margin and really truly understand your margin and your margin by product line or your margin by service, um, that's critical. Um, so, you know, on a $10 million business, 4% um, is $40,000. And so that's a lot of money um, that a, you know, that drops right to the bottom line. Um, so that's, that's, um, or did I get the math wrong? Is it 400,000? <laughs> that's you know, close enough. Math. That's, that's it's, enough it's, to get it's, anybody yeah. business owners I'm attention. I love that. <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, really want to manage that margin and then looking at, um, managing expenses is critical. Um, sometimes there's areas of a business where expense management, uh, can be, uh, can you know, over time it can build and you don't realize what you're really incurring costs on. What we've seen a lot of companies recently is their tech stack um, software costs can, can really get out of hand. And there's a real big opportunity to really take a second look at where am I spending money on my tech tech stack uh, for my business? And where is there opportunity to either renegotiate um, or, or find a different provider um, or, or reduce my services? Salesforce is a great example. You sign a long-term contract, you have a bunch of seats, uh, and sometimes you're paying for seats you don't need. Um, there's a big opportunity in the, in the tech stack to really visit and uh, you know audit that, take a look at it, and um, really evaluate if it makes sense. And I, I always say on the, on those other those costs associated with the business, are those costs maximizing uh, the business? Uh, is that cost of value add to the business? If not, you know, let's reevaluate it. You uh, mentioned that obviously the company's been around about 15 years. and You've been growing. We talked in the, before the pod about your expansion. How many employees today? We have uh, about 80 employees. Nice. And, and all over the country or are they mostly California? They're all over, actually. Uh, we, we started in San Diego. Uh, we, we built out into the uh, Los Angeles and Orange County markets. Um, but now we do ser- we service most of our clients, probably 80 to 90 percent of our clients fully remote. Um, so we have clients all over. We have uh, we strategically hire in different uh, time zones uh, to our team and based on different verticals and experience. So we have vertical groups within our organization that uh, service clients in those types of industries. Um, you know, we even have a nonprofit's a big group of ours. We have a nonprofit team. We have, um, we have a professional services team. We have a construction team. We have a manufacturing team. And so really branching out and, and really digging into and deep, diving deep into those verticals is critical um, so we can you know, bring that expertise to our clients that they couldn't otherwise find or afford otherwise. How would you say your leadership style has evolved over the years? Not just the 15 you've been with Signature Analytics, but, you know, compared to your time at uh, Deloitte. Yeah, I think um, I've always been, um, I, I, the approach I've taken is, is I don't have to be, or I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to, I, I you know, I, I would hope that I don't have an ego and I want to bring people to the table that I feel can ultimately help us to achieve the goals that we have. Um, I want to make sure that I know what's happening. I don't need to be an expert in every aspect of my business, but I need to know every aspect of my business so that I can manage, make sure I understand the the direction and and the the goals uh, and the process that we're going to take. And I can manage the individual or the teams against that process or goals. Um, as an example, six years ago, uh, 
brought on a, a CEO uh, for our company. And we have a great relationship. And uh, I brought him in because of his experience in, in growing and scaling a professional service business and organization. Um, so I want to, as, a, as the owner, as the founder, uh, I want to surround myself with the, the best talent uh, to achieve the goals that we have as an organization. Um, what I could say to you know, CEOs out there or individuals that want to be a CEO, one, one area that I, I really see, I see a lot of is that uh, individuals may start a business. They know they have an expertise in their trade or the reason why they started that business. They have an expertise. And uh, the, the, a lot of times I'll see a mindset that, okay, great. I know, you know how my business works. And once I get it started, I'll hire a salesperson and, and they'll manage sales and I'll hire uh, you know, somebody in marketing and they'll manage marketing and I'll hire uh, you know, somebody in operations. And usually the business owner is the operational person uh, depending on you know, what their experience is. But what I found uh, is if, uh, or, or I'll hire somebody, I'll hire somebody in finance or I'll hire a CFO and, and they'll take care of that. If the business owner or the CEO doesn't understand those aspects of all aspects of the business, it's going to be very, very difficult to be successful and to be able to scale. You don't have to be a, an expert in finance, but you sure as heck need to start learning how to read financial statements. You don't need to be an expert in sales, but you need to under or marketing, but you need to start to understand and build an understanding of of, of what market the term marketing terms are, what marketing strategies are, um, what sales approach we we are taking, um, because otherwise you have you're giving someone that you hired the freedom to do whatever they want, which may be good or bad, but you have no control over that. And in most cases, if you give somebody the freedom to do that, and there's no parameters, no guidelines. They start to, they may be a great and fantastic hire and have great experience, but they start to veer off the path of where you feel that as, as the business owner, you really feel they should be going. So really knowing sure. all aspects of your business is key. Hire the experts, but you have to know enough to be able to manage those individuals to be successful. Jason, what do you personally look for when you're making bets on the people you invest in and hire at uh, Signature Analytics? I think the number one thing is the ability to communicate. Um, communication is critical in, in success in a business. In what we do, we have to obviously know accounting and finance, but we have to be able to communicate effectively to really understand the goals of our clients and focus our efforts w into where they see the most value uh, for our services. So being able to communicate at the lowest level is critical. Being able to work together as a team, uh, being able to understand and work together to achieve goals is, is critical. Um, when I interview or when we interview, um, it's critical not to make assumptions. I think we just assume that for some, you know, if, if you ask somebody a question, uh, get, you know, and they give you a kind of a very high level generic example um the you know inherently i think we want to say okay yeah they you know they get it they understand it but what i found is maybe they don't right so when we're interviewing we have to really dig down keep asking more detailed questions try to dig deep into those certain areas and and get that individual to really dig deep and start um you know digging deep with you um and see how they communicate through that process um, you'll you'll learn a lot. So I, I've learned a lot through the hiring process and what what not to do and 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 what you know what has been successful and and the people that we have on board. Um, but I would say in any profession or almost any profession, the ability to communicate and work together as a team for the common goals of what we're trying to accomplish is by far the most critical um, area that we look for. Great stuff, Jason. Well, we're just about out of time, but we always ask our CEO guests one last question, and that's uh, what career and life advice would you give to someone that maybe has their eyes on the corner office or more importantly, wants to be an entrepreneur like you, maybe has worked for a large corporate organization for you know, 10, 15 years and wants to go out on their own? What would you tell them? Yeah, I think I'd go back to, so a um, couple things. One, what I found, the only way I found to be successful is to be fully committed. So jump in with two feet. 
what I have found not to be successful is individuals who kind of dabble over here on the side, try to start something up while they're also doing one thing. And I, I get it. The financial side of it is probably why um, it's very difficult to do that. But unless you're fully committed, you're not going to, I believe it's very difficult to, to see success. Um, the next thing is that willpower will get you a long way. Um, after two years, I had not seen much fruits of my labor, but I was determined. And in my mind, I continued to see the long-term payoff and felt that, you know, I was going to will myself to success. Um, you can, willpower will get you a long way. Um, I've seen a lot of individuals, they try something out and three to six months later, you know, they're off doing something else. Um, you got to give it time and, and believe in yourself is critical. And then the other area that I mentioned is that um, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You want to hire the experts, but you've got to know every aspect of your business. You've got to learn how to read financials. You've got to learn, um, you know, the marketing and sales strategies, even if that's not your background. Um, most CEOs, the operational side or is probably where they have the experience. Um, but those other aspects are critical. And so bring in the experts. And, you know, obviously that's what Signature Analytics does. We are the expert um, in that area. And, and we hope, help to coach and train the CEOs so that they know their numbers and, and can make good decisions. Great stuff. Jason Kruger, president and founder of Signature Analytics. Thank you so very much for sharing your journey into the corner office. Thanks so much, Brent. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode. 